It's a little book right before Revelation. The book of Jude. I'm at that stage where my glasses are not working for my eyes, meaning my eyes are getting worse. Anybody know anything about that? I'm glad there's not going to be any glasses in heaven, aren't you? Amen. Amen. And if they do have them, at least they won't get scratched. Have smudges. I can't read with them. I can't read without them. So I'm in, I'm in limbo here. I have to have them on to read, but when I, when I look out, I can't see anything. So I'm going to get my eyes checked Tuesday, see if I can get that fixed. You, know, you look funny without your glasses on. I look funny with them on. What are you talking about? So... Don't let that distract you too much. Stand with me, please. The book of Jude. We're going to look at uh, a couple of my favorite verses in the Bible. I've got a lot of favorite verses. But the one of them is right here in Jude. In Jude, there was one chapter. Jude chapter 1. Jude verse 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others, saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Lord, help us tonight, I pray, as we expound these verses. May we rightly divide the word of truth, and may God's people be encouraged, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Before I get into my message, let me just give you a quick uh, update. I meant to do that earlier and slipped my mind, but we had a great couple of services out in Salisbury. Heard you had a great service Wednesday night. Brother Snipes, appreciate Brother Snipes filling in. But him and his wife, by the way, are in North Carolina. And so that's where they are. But um, I preached Wednesday night and then Thursday morning and Thursday night there in Salisbury for Brother Leto. And uh, on Thursday morning, it was an evangelistic service. They bust in a lot of people from the senior citizens' uh, places and uh, retirement homes and nursing homes and feed them a meal. Had, had grilled chicken, had a delicious meal. And our family sang. And I preached the gospel. This is the third year they've had me out there for that. And uh, I preached the gospel, the gospel message, and six precious souls accepted Christ as their Savior. So uh, we rejoice in that. But the night services was a great, great spirit, good liberty. And uh, it's always a unique uh, time. Brother uh, Hudson, his wife, uh, slipped over there on Wednesday night and uh, had the old sawdust trail, the open air, and, and skeeters. You know what skeeters are, don't you? Oh, they had a lot of skeeters. And uh, we, fortunately, we sprayed down with off and whatever else we could get. And, uh, but uh, just, just uh, remembering my past days, camp meeting days, they don't do much of those anymore. But in Salisbury, they have one every year. And uh, we appreciate Brother Leto and his confidence in us and asking us to come, be a part of that. And we appreciate God working. The altars were packed every night that we preached. And we rejoiced in seeing God work. And uh, so pray, appreciate you praying for us while we were gone and uh, we missed being here and was glad to get back this morning, be back in our home church. Wasn't it good to have Brother Rowan with us today? Yeah. Amen. Appreciate Brother Rowan and his family. And uh, we've been so proud of them, seeing what God's doing in them with their life. And, and uh, now they're working in the UK and his wife and kids. He just had a little baby, number five. He just had another baby, first of June. And uh, so his wife was not able to be here uh, but uh, maybe one day you meet the whole family. His wife is precious, and uh, thank God for what he's doing with them in their life. But I want to, if I can, preach on a subject that's passion of mine, and that is uh, the verse. We're going to get to verse number 22 in just a moment. If some have compassion, making a difference. I want to preach on this thought tonight, keys to influence. Keys to influence. Now, one of the things that I've learned in the ministry is that not everybody understands the amount of influence that they have. But everybody has influence. I was reading in a leadership book years ago and a statistic stuck in my mind, I've never forgotten it. 
And it said the most shy, quiet, bashful, reserved person will influence no less than 10,000 people in the span of their lifetime. People are watching. People that you don't know are watching are watching. And they look at your life and they make decisions based on what they see you and, us, you and I do. And what we should do tonight, rather than try to uh, ignore or shun or shirk uh, the, the impact of our lives on others, we should embrace it and we should ask God to help us have a positive influence on others. Amen. Now some people obviously influence uh, much more than others, but I think that you and I are in a position as Christians in 2018 to make a drastic difference. The question is, do we want to? And if we say we want to, do we know how? Do we know how to maximize our influence? Do we know how to position ourselves to have the greatest amount of impact on the lives of others so that one day when you and I stand before God at the judgment seat, we maybe can have some crowns, some trophies, some rewards to cast at his feet because we have represented heaven and we've been an ambassador for Christ and we've made a difference in a lost and dying world. Well, we could easily just take 45 minutes tonight and preach out of verse number 22, but I want to preach out of the passage surrounding it because of the context. And in Jude, Jude's talking here about false teachers and false prophets. He's dealing with that much throughout the book of Jude. And when you get down to verse number 17, he just kind of hunkers down and is just giving some strong admonition, some words of encouragement to the people of God. And I believe that we can safely loop in verse 17 down through verse 23 and put all this together and get together a portrait of some ways and the keys to having a positive influence and making a difference. Some people are agents of change, whether they realize it or not. Let me say this, God has always used people that were willing to be an agent of change. You've got people that want to just kind of settle in the status quo. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to make too many waves. They want to fly under the radar and just kind of live their life invisible. But I chose a long time ago, if God wanted to use me to make a difference, I was willing to let him do that. To do that, there's going to be some things in your life that you need to have together. So let's look at three or four of these tonight, or five or six or eight, or ever how many God lets us get to. I've got five really in front of me just from verse 17 down through verse number 23, if you're taking notes, these are some things that you and I are gonna need to do if God is gonna use us to make a difference in the lives of others. Number one, write this down. In verse number 17, we see a remembrance of the scripture. Look at what it says. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he's continuing on with that thought, but I think that it's important that you and I understand that if God is going to use us to make a difference in somebody else's life, he's going to do it through his word more than through mine and your opinions. If all you and I do is go around spouting out our opinions and our philosophies and what we think and, and our solutions and our logic, we may have a little bit of influence, but it won't be long-term and it won't be eternal. It won't be lasting. The secret is to, for you and I to know and familiarize ourselves with the word of God so that whenever we try to make a difference, we can do it through the power of the word of God. You hear that a lot from here. You learn a lot from, you hear that a lot from me. You hear that a lot from this pulpit about the importance of the word of God. We heard it in Sunday school this morning. And we heard it again in the morning service and you're hearing it again tonight that the word of God is what is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, the Bible tells us. The word of God is what's going to get the job done. And so if you and I are going to be agents of change, if we're going to influence people, then you and I are not only gonna to have to use the word of God to change others, but we're gonna to have to allow the word of God to change us. There has to be a remembrance of the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we remember it? Well, you have to read it. You have to meditate on it. You have to memorize it. You have to rehearse it in your mind. 
If we're going to make a difference, we need to have a good knowledge of the scriptures. People are looking for answers. They're not looking for opinions. They're not looking for philosophies. They're not looking for just everybody to just regurgitate what they think and what they've done in the past and their experiences. They need something that they can put some hope in. They need something they can drop their anchor in. And when you go to people and you say, here's what God said, that resonates with people. Now, they may not always respond in a positive way. They may not even always obey it, but they will hear it and they will remember the word of God. The word of God has a way of putting a hook in people. You better believe it. I joke about the, uh, the old black man that was, uh, he, he came up to the preacher, he, he came down the aisle, he walked up to the preacher at the end of the service, he said, preacher, I need to get saved. He said, really? He said, what brought this about? He said, well, those little papers, he said, you call them tracks. He said, somebody gave me one a few weeks ago, and whoever called them tracks, he said, they named them right. Because that thing tracked me to town. It tracked me to work. It tracked me to bed. It tracked me everywhere I went. He said, I can't get away from it. Now, he had the right idea. Amen. Spelt different, but he had the right idea. Because the word of God will put a hook in somebody. You've got to know it, though, before you can use it. Read the word of God. Familiarize yourself with the word of God. We need to be able to remember the scriptures and point others to the word of God. Because the word of God is what brings about a change. That's why Ephesians 5 says in verse 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he may present to himself a glorious church having neither spot nor wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy without blemish. So in Ephesians 5, we see that he sanctifies and cleanses the body of Christ with the washing of water by the word. The word has a powerful impact on people. I tell you, whenever I'm in a position where I'm talking to someone from a cult, someone from one of these religions that do not believe vital Bible truths, you can argue with them till you're blue in the face. You're not going to get anywhere. What you do is you take your Bible, open it up, and say, read that verse right there and tell me what it means. And watch them all of a sudden balk. Because they don't know what to do with that. Which is why many of them write their own translation so they can try to get around the truth of the Scriptures. Amen, but I can take a Jehovah's Witness, they use the New World Translation, I can take the New World Translation and tie them up in knots. Amen. As bad as it is, and it's bad. I mean, it's real bad. But you can take a Jehovah's Witness's New World Translation and you can take the Bible, uh, sit down with a Mormon, who they use the King James Bible along with the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. You sit down with the King James Bible and you can take a Mormon and turn them in knots just by saying, read that verse and tell me what it means. That Bible is important. If you want to influence people, if you want to maximize your influence, remember the scriptures. And I, I said this already, but I want to say it again. Before the word of God can change others, we must allow it to change us. So if you're taking notes, number one, a remembrance of the scripture. I encourage you to know your Bible and have a Bible verse for everything you say you believe. It don't work to say, well, that's what my mom and daddy believed. So my, that's what my preacher said. That's what my church preached. I was talking to Brother Rowan either last night or this morning. I told him, I said, I said, one of the things that I realized when I got to South Africa as a missionary, I was 29 or 30 when I got to the field, and I grew up in a pastor's home. My daddy was a, a pastor. I grew up in a preacher's home. I was exposed to a lot of Bible. Then my parents were missionaries in the 80s. I grew up on the mission field and was actively involved in my dad starting churches from scratch and discipling new converts. I mean, it was my life. As a 12, 13-year-old boy, I sat at the dining room table while my dad trained the national pastor that eventually he ordained and turned the church over to him. And I thought to myself, I know everything he knows and more. Because I sat at the table while he was being trained. I learned the scriptures and the ministry. And I went to Bible college for four years. And then I went to South Africa. And every single day of my life, I was confronted with some sort of a question that I wasn't sure about the answer because I realized... I'd been hanging around everybody that believed like me. And they don't ask those questions. Then you go to Bloemfontein, South Africa, where every stripe and every cult and every weird theology known to man is in that town. And somehow or another, they found me. I remember one time I was sitting in the store and I walked back in the back and started talking to the owners. One of the things I did was try to build relationships with business owners. I just walked back there in their office, have a cup of coffee and just talk to them and get to know them and... and uh, the Lord opened up a lot of doors. I remember one day a man got down on his hands and knees 
I mean, he had his hands and knees. He was leaning over my lap. And he was saying, I beg you, please stop baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And baptize them in the name of Jesus. I'm like, man, get off of me. And he was so passionate, he had me going and looking through my Bible. Because you go to the book of Acts, it says they baptize them in the name of Jesus. Well, that's what it says. But the Great Commission is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Is that what it says? But I mean, I had some crazy doctrines thrown at me. I had men come to our church that had doctor's degrees. They were professors in the Free State University. And they'd come to our church and they'd say, oh, we love to hear you preach. The only problem is you're off on this or this or this. Or they'd write me some kind of a letter. I remember one guy wrote me a thesis. He wrote like a three-page thesis. I wrote him back like a six-page thesis. Then he wrote me back a nine-page thesis. And I went, okay, you won't do that? I stayed up all night and wrote a book. He said, I give up. I had more Bible verses than he knew what to do with. My point is this. If you want to make a difference, you need to know your Bible. Because that Bible right there is what works. Not only do we see the remembrance of the Scriptures, I said all that to say this, I studied my Bible more the first year I was on the mission field than I had my whole life up to that point put together. I mean hours and hours digging through my Bible, everything I had ever been taught, everything I'd ever learned in church and in vacation Bible school and in camp meetings and revivals, everything I had ever been taught, I had to go back for myself and re-examine it and let God nail it down in my heart. Because man, I'm telling you, if you're gonna make a difference, you gotta know that Bible. You can only say I don't know so much before your level of influence begins to diminish. Yes, that's right. We see a remembrance of the scriptures. Number two, there has to be a rejection of the sensual. Look at verse 18 and 19. But remember the words that were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. What is he saying? He's saying there's a group of people out there that's mocking the things of God and they operate, they walk, they live their life based on their own sensual lust and their own ungodly lust. And I want you to know in verse number 19 that the life that they live is sensual and fleshly. It is not of the Holy Spirit. Is everybody still with me? If you wanna make a difference in somebody's life, if you wanna have influence, you have to reject that which is sensual, you have to reject that which is ungodly, and you cannot operate and live according to your own ungodly lusts. How are you gonna change people if you're just like them? There's an us and them mentality in these verses. They, told you that there should be mockers in the last times who should walk after their uh, own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. So walk in the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. You want to make a difference? You want to have an impact? You want to influence others? Walk a spiritual life rather than a sensual, ungodly, carnal, wicked life life. By the way, if it's sensual, it's not spiritual. That's what it says. They're sensual having not the spirit. We've got to stop being governed by our natural senses and allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead us. Amen. We've got to stop walking by the flesh, living after the flesh. They that walk after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, Paul said. And I'm going to be honest with you. You'll never have influence as a Christian living a sensual, carny, carnal, worldly life. Right. People will see that and be turned off. Amen. They may be nice. They may, they, may, they may treat you nice. They may not treat you any different. But when the time comes down for you to actually make a difference in their life, they won't look you up. They're going to look for somebody that's spiritual. Right. Amen. Those that walk after their own lust are making a mockery of spiritual things. So what it says in verse number 18. There will be those that are mockers in the last time who shall walk after their own ungodly lust. If you and I say we're saved and we say we're Christians, but we walk after our own ungodly lust, we're actually mocking the things of God. And trust me, the world notices that. 
I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because it would be very embarrassing. How many of us in here that are Christians have had an unsaved person say to us, but I thought you said you were saved. I thought you were a Christian. And what they're saying is, why are you doing what you just did if you say you're a Christian? It got quiet, didn't it? We cannot be an agent of change if we allow our natural man to dictate our walk. We've got to walk in the spirit and allow God to direct our path. Just let this soak in for just a second. Here's our problem. If we had to choose between being carnal and worldly or influencing others, most people would just choose being carnal. By the way, like I said, people are watching whether you realize it or not. You say, well, I'm not really worried about influencing others. I'm just going to live my own life. Well, that attitude and that lifestyle is still going to influence other people. Mainly our children, our young people. One of the things that turns young people away from God is parents telling them to be spiritual when their parents aren't spiritual. I've heard parents before say to their kids, oh, I want you to be the next D.L. Moody. I want you to be the next Charles Spurgeon. I want you to be the next whoever. Why don't you be the next D.L. Moody? Because they didn't know D.L. Moody. They know you. Oh, I want you to be the next whoever. Why don't you live the life of a Christian hero in front of your children and then tell them just be like you? You want, you want our, we, want, we want our kids to look up to other people, but they're not around those other people. They don't know those other people. Right. They live with you. Yes. Amen. Quiet, ain't it? Good. Well, preacher, I'm just not spiritual enough to be an example of my kids, and whose fault is that? Amen. We want our children to be more spiritual than we are. We aim high for our children, or we say we do, then we don't bring them back to church on, on Sunday night. Come on. We say we want our kids to succeed and go all the way with God and do whatever God wants them to do, and then we stay home and don't bring them to church. And then we wonder why our kids get cold and backslid and start re being disobedient and rebellion at ho uh, rebellious at home. And get, you say, I thought, the, I thought God was doing a work in your heart. God was doing a work in your heart until mom and daddy got carnal. I know it's good preaching, but you wouldn't know it from the amens I'm getting right now. You can't make a difference in somebody's life if you're living a sensual, carnal life. You're walking after your own ungodly lust. We need to be spirit-filled. There has to be a rejection of that which is sensual, embracing of that which is spiritual. Number three, are we having fun yet? A remembrance of the scriptures a rejection of the sensual. Thirdly, in verse 20, there has to be a revitalizing of self. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Let's just talk about revitalizing ourselves for just a few minutes. Because before you can help build up others, you gotta learn how to build up yourself. Before you can strengthen other people's faith, you need to learn how to revitalize and strengthen and build up your own most holy faith. And the devil's gonna cause your faith to, to waver. He's gonna cause your faith to wobble. You're gonna find yourself struggling with doubts and believing God and trusting God. At that time, you need to kick into some exercises and build up yourself on your most holy faith. Because before you're ever going to make a difference in somebody else's life, you've got to learn how to make a difference in your own life. Amen. You're going to have to have your finger on the pulse of your spiritual man. Amen. When you feel that pulse starting to get weak, you've got to do something. Amen. That's right. Stay with me now. You've got to recognize where you're at spiritually. You need to have... You need to have such an acute awareness of your walk with God that you know when you're getting cold and when you're getting weak and when you're, getting, when you're drifting away from God and you need to make sure you know how to build yourself back up. Amen, that's right. I know what some of you are thinking, but pastor, isn't that your job? 
To help build me up? Yes, my job is to build up and edify. It's the church's job to help build up and edify one another. But it wouldn't hurt you to pick up a hammer and help. Amen. Amen. We can only do so much. Isaiah, if you feel yourself getting cold on God, if you know you are, and everybody else around you is trying to get you on fire for God, if you don't want to get on fire for God, guess what? You're not going to get on fire for God. It's only going to work when you build up yourself. on your most holy faith. Building up yourselves. I can tell when I'm getting cold spiritually just like you can. Here's the problem. A lot of times we just allow ourselves to get colder and colder and colder. We allow ourselves to get more comfortable and more comfortable and comfortable. And whereas before we used to be on the edge of our seat anticipating every word from the preacher and we was loving church, now we're just sitting back sleeping through it. At some point you're gonna to have to learn to build up yourself on your most holy faith. And he tells us how to do it in the verse. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Maintaining your most holy faith is key to living the Christian life. Your battery will run down if you don't. How many in here knows what it's like for your spiritual battery to run down? Oh yeah. I wish we had little, little, uh, little things on us where we could look and see where our battery's at. I got three bars, I got four bars, I got five bars, I'm, I got two bars, oh, I better go pray. We don't have that, but the Spirit of God will tell us where we're at. And when you start feeling yourself getting cold and you start feeling yourself getting indifferent and you start feeling yourself becoming desensitized to the things of God, guess what the cue is? To go pray. Your strength will fail if you don't. You'll grow weary and well-doing and faint if you don't. Because the Christian life is rough on the flesh. You can quote me on that. The Christian life is rough on the flesh. If you try and do it in the flesh, you won't last. I heard a preacher, way, way better preacher than me say what I'm about to say. But he was telling the truth. He said, you can sin and sing. He said, you can sin and tithe. He said, you could sin and go to church. He said, you could sin and witness. You can even sin and preach, but you cannot sin and pray. When you've got sin in your life, last thing you want to do is pray. You get down to pray, and the minute you start praying, the devil says, oh, what are you doing praying? What about this? Yeah. What? <laughs> Some of y'all looking at me funny. Either you don't ever pray or you don't ever sin. I think I know which one it is. I, I, gotta, I gotta read this. You're right there at it. Keep your place in, in Jude. Turn back to 1 John 3. Turn back, turn, turn back to 1 John chapter number 3. You need to underline these verses. If you're writing your Bible, you need to underline these verses right here. 1 John 3, are you there? Yes, sir. Look at verse number 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Guess what will kill your confidence in the prayer closet? Right. Disobedience and sin. I'm not making this up. It's what it says. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He said in verse number 20, if our heart condemn us, God's greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. I'm gonna tell you why we don't have confidence in our prayer life. We get down to pray and we start thinking about all the sin in our life and it kills our confidence to pray. You don't even wanna pray. And the devil's saying, what are you doing praying? 
Remember, what you, remember, remember how you talked to your wife last night? Remember how you talked to your kids? Remember what you did today when nobody was around? And here you are down here praying. You think God's going to listen to you? And you just get up off your knees and go on about the day. Well, what you need to do is confess those sin, right. get forgiveness of that sin, and pray a little while in the Holy Ghost so you can build up yourself in your most holy faith. Amen. Most people quit praying because it's too much trouble to just get right with God. Amen. Jude, building up yourselves. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You're going to have a hard time influencing others if you can't even keep yourself lined out. And I'll, trust me, I know it's a full-time job. It's a full-time job staying right with God. We live in a filthy world. I mean, you can pray, read your Bible, get your armor on, leave the house, and before you get to Home Depot, you've got fiery darts stuck everywhere. I know. I live in the same town you live in. It's wicked. It's ungodly. Is everybody still with me? Yes, sir. You gotta learn to revitalize yourself if you wanna influence others. You're gonna have to learn how to stay walking with God even if there's nobody checking on you. I mean, we got a lot of people, we got a lot of people, if they're not in ICU, they won't even survive. Somebody's got to come in every five minutes and check their blood pressure and check their pulse. Ask them if they're okay for them to make it. Well, guess what? You won't influence a lot of people if you can't make it no longer than that by yourself. I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach you as Christians to learn how to build up yourself. If you're dependent on somebody else to keep you going, you might not go very long. There may not always be somebody around to help you along the way. You're going to have to learn to build a relationship with God and learn how to build yourself up on your most holy faith. And you do that by establishing a spirit-filled prayer life. Amen. Amen. You'd be shocked at how many people don't even know what it means to pray in the Holy Ghost. I don't mean praying in tongues, by the way. The charismatics have taken that phrase, praying in the Holy Ghost, and made it say something that it doesn't say. It doesn't say praying in an unknown tongue. I don't know, they say to me, it said, Pastor Schiff, I, I pray in tongues because it's a, it's a prayer language. And I don't want the, it's a heavenly prayer language and I don't want the devil to know what I'm saying. I said, you do know the devil came from heaven, don't you? If there is such a thing as a heavenly language and we don't have any indication that there is, but if there was a heavenly prayer language, the devil would know it. Because he used to live in heaven. <laughs> Shot that in the head, didn't it? That's not talking about praying in tongues. That's not talking about entering into your prayer closet and saying, see me, Tamata, see me, Tamata. She came on the Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You didn't know I could speak in tongues, did you? I can teach you how to speak in tongues. You ready? See me, Tamata. See me, Untamata. She came in on the Honda and she left on the Yamaha. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. Praying in the Holy Ghost means you get down to business and you're beginning to pray and the Holy Spirit is helping you and you're getting a hold of God and you're cutting through to the third heaven and you're not just going through the form and going through the motions, but you're actually getting a hold of the horns of the altar. That's how you build up yourself in your most holy faith. Most Christians live their whole Christian life never learn what it means to pray in the Holy Ghost. Let's hurry. I gotta preach at the rescue mission here in a little bit. I gotta save a little bit. I'm about to, about to run out of gas up here. Prayer. Praying in the Holy Ghost means a hot and fervent prayer life. Not a weak, spasmodic, inconsistent, once a week, twice a week, five minutes here, two minutes there prayer life. You won't make it if you don't learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost and you'll never influence others and impact lives until you learn how to pray. I'm not talking about a prayer life that's a prayer life just for show. People always talk about how much they pray make me nervous because that's a direct contradiction to the scriptures. 
Bible says if you give alms, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. And the Bible says when you pray, enter into your prayer closet and what you do in secret, I'll reward you openly. I don't need to hear about how much you give and I don't need to hear about how much you pray. Just do it. Amen. People, some people couldn't talk about how much they pray. They wouldn't even pray. You're welcome. Prayer refreshes your spiritual man. Prayer revitalizes your walk with God. Prayer will reinvigorate your zeal and your fire to serve God. I know some of y'all have a hard time believing it, but there are some days I really ain't excited about pastoring Calvary Baptist Church. I really ain't excited about doing anything for God. Some days. Oh, no, he didn't. No, no, he didn't, girlfriend. There are some days I'm not excited. I'm not excited about being a spiritual leader in my home. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what will help revitalize your fervency and your zeal. A little talk with Jesus. Make it right, amen. Prayer reinforces your purpose and your commitment. A lot of people spend their whole life trying to figure out what God wants them to do. How much time have you spent praying about it? We just preached it this morning, Jeremiah 33, 3, calling to me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things which I know it's not. You say you need God's direction and leadership and guidance in your life. Why don't you turn the television off, turn your phone off and spend some time praying and asking God to give you some direction. Amen. Let God nail it down in your heart Amen. in the prayer closet. You won't be able to help anybody anywhere, anytime till you learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to hurry. Number four. There needs to be a recognition of the spiritual. Look at verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That keep yourselves is not talking about keeping yourself saved. You can't keep yourself saved any more than you could get saved by yourself to start with. You can't get saved by yourself and you can't keep yourself saved. I believe here what he's talking about is living a life guarding. That word keep means to guard, safe keep, to give attention to. In other words, having a God consciousness, Amen. a constant awareness that God is here and that God is watching and you don't take the love of God and the mercy of God for granted. Or as Paul said over and over, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Amen. Don't take for granted the love of God. The love of God is, is, is there's nothing can separate us from the love of God, Romans 8 says. Height, nor breadth, nor, nor heaven, nor earth, or anything under the sea, or no, 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 no creature, nothing can separate you from the love of God. You don't have to keep yourself in the love of God. He loved you before you was even born. He loved you when you was dead in trespasses and sins. Amen. That's what it says. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God who is rich in mercy, and the great lover with he loved us. Amen, he loved us before we was even saved. But we need to have a God consciousness and recognize we need to live a life that's worthy of the love of God and the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. Live a life of appreciation for the love of God. Live a life daily appreciating the blessings of God's mercy. This should be a recognition of the spiritual, but fifthly, you're trying to get to verse 22, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Write this down, number five, there's a regard for souls. There's a regard for souls. This is really what I was trying to get to. Keys to influence, making a difference. In order to make a difference, you have to have a regard for the souls of other people. Somehow or another, some people seem to insulate themselves from the world around them and they live their whole life with blinders on, never seeing the hurting, never see the dying, never see the lonely, never see those that need help along the way, walk right by them without even giving them a minute's notice. The life of a believer will impact lives and influence lives. You need two things, a life of compassion. Compassion. Seeing people in need and having a heart of love and compassion for them. By the way, compassion isn't man-made. Compassion isn't worked up. It's a true selfless love for others that are in need. You and I must have compassion on others if we're going to make a difference. You see somebody struggling, your heart ought to go out to them. You see somebody 
stumbling along life's way, your heart ought to go out to them. Another believer, another brother or sister in the Lord who's got feeble hands and they just can't seem to make it, your heart ought to go out to them and try to help them out. Spend time with them. Pull away from your normal little clique. We have our little inner circle, don't we? We have our few on speed dial. These are the ones we like to hang around and do stuff with. Maybe you, need to, maybe you need to ask God to enlarge your coast and broaden your sphere of influence instead of hanging around the same two or three people all the time and talking to them before and after church and calling them and going out and doing things with them. Maybe you need to reach out to somebody that you don't know that could use a helping hand. Is everybody still with me? Invite them over for a meal. Invite them out for coffee. Yes. I mean, a couple dollars for a cup of coffee, it's a small price to pay. Build a relationship with people that you see, man, they look like, they, they look, they look like they're hurting. They look like they need some help. I'm not talking about financial help. I'm talking about a friend, somebody to love them and care about them and pray for them. You might have to move outside of your little comfort zone. Is everybody still with me? Could you imagine how much we could get done if everybody in this church loved everybody, loved everybody the way we're supposed to, had compassion one on another? I'm, talking about, I'm not even talking about outside the church. We ain't got there yet. I'm just talking about inside the church. There are people in this church right now that are hurting. And you've passed them four times today. Did you even notice? Their head's down. The light's gone out of their eyes. They're not their smiling, happy, jovial self. They're under a burden. Did you notice? Come on, preacher. That's right. And it's amazing sometimes what just a word of encouragement will mean. Somebody knows you care. Sometimes I just send a text message. I say, I've had you on my heart. Are you okay? You wouldn't believe the responses I get. Preacher, how did you know? Did you know? just tell I could just tell I could sit on your face you're here but you're not here and sometimes I catch myself not seeing things I, I get upset with myself that I don't see more than what I see I think man I should have picked up on that but I tell you what I'm trying to say tonight is if you want to influence others you need to have a regard for the souls of others Make a difference. Amen. You never know, never underestimate what a kind word, what an encouraging word, text message, a card. Just saying, would you, let's grab coffee sometime. Let's grab coffee sometime. Man, it just, it'll, 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 it'll fire up a spark in people's soul. Amen. Am, I, am, am I getting through here tonight? Are y'all with me? And I know you're busy. Goodness, we're all busy. We're so busy. I, my wife and I were talking about the other day. She said, Stacey, it just seemed like something going on all the time. Yeah. All the time, something going on. Every day, every week, just something, just one, one thing after the other. Used to, the highlight of the day was sitting on the front porch watching the bug zapper. If I had a bug zapper, I would never get to watch it. How many of y'all remember the bug zappers? Those were the good old days, wasn't it? Just sit there and watch it. Watch the moth circle the bug zapper. There he goes, there he goes. Zah! Went home to be with the Lord. Man, I'd love, to, I'd love to get back to those days just sitting around watching the bug zapper. There's so much going on. But listen to me. If you catch yourself just living your whole life to yourself, you've got this my four and no more mentality, you're not going to be able to influence a lot of people. It needs to be a life of compassion. And there needs to be a life of conversion, meaning, verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Having a soul consciousness that recognizes the need of the lost. Let's just get real this, this evening. People need saving. People need saving. And God does the saving, but he uses people to do it. Can I say that again? God does the saving, but he's going to use you and I to do it. Now, I want you to look up here just a minute. I'm going to ask you a very personal question. How many people can you say you've pulled out of the fire? 
in all the time that you've been saved, how many people have you pulled out of the fire? We got some soul winners in this church, put all of us to shame. We got some folks, we got some men and some women in this church right here that's winning souls left and right. And I thank God for them. Yes. But Brother Tim, I think about what would it be like if everybody in here was that way? Amen. There wouldn't be an empty chair. There wouldn't be an empty seat in this church. That's right. Amen. You wouldn't be able to get them in here if all of us in here had the right regard for lost people that we ought to have. Amen. I said us. I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to the staff on behind me. I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to all of us. Amen. Good. We need to pull them out of the fire. Yes. They're on their way to hell. Do we even care? Right. Do we even care? I mean, let's just, get, let's just be honest. I shouldn't have to mention it, but one time that we're passing out tracks at the 4th of July parade, I shouldn't have to mention it no more. Right, right. Preacher, that's the day I'm having a picnic. We're all going to have a picnic, but we can have a picnic after we go pass out 10,000 tracks. Amen. Let's go pass out 10,000 tracks and then go have a picnic and eat some watermelon. Amen? Yes, yes. I mean, we're the church. We have the truth. Yes. We're saved on our way to heaven. We ought to make it a priority to pull as many people out of the fire as we possibly can and make a difference. Right. Hey. Preacher's just one here and there. It's not that big of a deal. Making a, we ain't making a whole lot of impact. 65,000 people in Dundalk. There's 45,000 people in Essex. We got 400,000, 400,000 people in the seven mile radius of this church. Mm. Heard about the man and his little boy walking up the beach and the tide had come in. There were starfish laying everywhere. I mean starfish, just hundreds of them laying up through there. The little boy reached down and picked up one he threw it back up in the ocean and his daddy said, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm saving that starfish. He said, good night, son. Starfish dying everywhere. He said, it don't matter. He said, it mattered to that one. Amen. It mattered to that one. Amen. You can't put a price on a soul. You can't put a price on a soul. These little kids that come in here and ride the buses and go to junior church, when one of them gets saved, most people don't even, don't, it don't even phase them. Guess what? It made news in heaven. The Bible says there was rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. We ought to be leading them to Christ left and right. There ought not to be a single week goes by the baptismal waters at Calvary Baptist Church are not stirred. I said there ought not to be a single week goes by. And we keep the water warm. You go up there right now, it's warm. It's ready right now. Hey man, we got the waiters. Right. We just need the new converts. Right. That's where you come in. Yeah. Is everybody still with me? Good. Oh, preacher, you're doing good. You got on soul winning and prayer. If God's people get back to praying and winning souls, we turn this country around. Right. I'm going to tell you what would make America great again. The church of the living God getting back to making a difference. It's time for an invitation. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Lord, it's been encouraging, it's been edifying, it's been reproving, rebuking, instructive all at the same time. I pray, Lord, that Calvary Baptist Church tonight would do some soul searching, search their heart. See, Lord, if the keys to influence apply to us remembering the scriptures and refraining from a life of sensual lust and sin and learning to revitalize our spiritual man, praying in the Holy Ghost. And Father, I pray that you'd give us a burden and a compassion for the lost and for those around us that are in need. May we not leave here tonight till we've made some commitments, Lord, to make a difference.